Hey everybody, Tim Albrecht here, and thank you for listening to the YFP Podcast, where each week we strive to inspire and encourage you on your path towards achieving financial freedom. This week, Tim Baker joins us back on the mic to talk through six financial moves to make as a mid-career pharmacist. We discuss the importance of resetting the vision for the financial plan, how to determine whether or not you're on track for retirement, gaps to look for in your estate planning and insurance coverage, and much more. For more information and details on each one of these areas, go to yourfinancialpharmacist.com forward slash mid-career. That's one word. Again, yourfinancialpharmacist.com forward slash mid-career. Before we jump into this week's episode, I have a hard truth for you to hear. Making a six-figure income is not a financial plan. Yes, you've worked hard to get where you are today. Yes, you're earning a good income. But have you ever wondered, am I on track to retire? How do I prioritize and fund all of these competing financial goals that I have? How do I plan financially for big upcoming life events and changes such as moving, having a child, changing jobs, getting married or retiring? Or perhaps why am I not as far along financially at this point in my career as I thought I would be? The answer may be that your six-figure income is not a financial plan. As a pharmacist, you have an incredible tool in your toolbox, your salary. But without a vision and a plan, that good income will only go so far. That's in part why we started Your Financial Pharmacist. At YFP, we support pharmacists at every stage of their careers to take control of their finances, reach their financial goals, and build wealth through comprehensive fee-only financial planning and tax planning. Our team of certified financial planners and our CPA works with pharmacists all across the country to help our clients set their future selves up for success while living their rich lives today. If you're ready to learn more about how your financial pharmacist can support you on your financial journey, visit yourfinancialpharmacist.com forward slash learn. Again, that's yourfinancialpharmacist.com forward slash learn. All right, let's jump into today's show. Tim Baker, good to have you back on the show. Good to be back, Tim. How's it going? Good. It's been a while. Official congrats on uh, the baby. I know you were off for a little while, but we're glad to have you back on the mic. Yeah, thanks for... Uh... Thanks for hosting. It's just trying to get back in the swing of things. Bait with baby here. Uh, sleep is at a premium, so it's all, all good. <laughs> well, this week we're talking about moves that mid-career pharmacists should be making, things that they should be thinking about, and really wh whether someone is early in their journey, you know, these are things to be thinking ahead of or those that are actually in this season. Hopefully this is more of a checklist type of a episode where you can go through different parts of the financial plan or perhaps tune up or, or look back at some of these items. Tim, it dawned on me though, as we're, we're preparing for this episode of like, that's us mid, mid career. Uh, you know, it's really that, that phase where you start to feel like, Hey, we've kind of checked off some of those basic foundational items, but there's this whole other set of issues and things that we need to be thinking about going to the future. So for better or for worse, here we are in, in the middle of our career as well. And we're excited to talk through these six moves that mid-career pharmacists should be making. And each one of these we have covered at length, if not once, maybe twice or three times on the episode before. So we'll make sure to mention that when we get to these individual items and link to those things in the show notes as well. Tim, I think it makes sense that we start number one really with the goals. You know, th this is an opportunity, I think, to reset the vision for the financial plan. There often is a lot of transition that can be happening at this phase. You know, this might be the time where people have kids that are getting a little bit older, maybe beginning to think about them moving out of the house. We obviously have to be thinking about taking care of ourselves. Maybe we have elderly parents that we're trying to prioritize as well. So just a lot of transition. I think an opportunity to take a step back and really look at the vision and the goals for the financial plan and how those have changed over time. Yeah, I would package these. I actually, I would actually package this together with like, what does the balance sheet look like? And then what is the vision mm. going forward? So, mm -hmm. you know, we kind of look at this, you know, when we work with clients as a get organized and kind of a goal set in, you know, and as, as a one, two punch. And, and this is typically where Tim, when a pharmacist asks me a question of, Hey, should I do X or Y? I say, it depends. A lot of it depends on what is, what does the financial picture look like for you? Mm -hmm. And then what does a wealthy life look like for you both today and in the future? And, and for everyone that's going to be different. So, that to me is where that answer comes from. So yeah, like I, I think in, in prepping for this episode, Tim, I, I kind of learned, you know, two things or, or, or re, re realized two things um, that I think is really important to say out loud is one is just like a lot of stuff. When I was looking at my, you know, I was looking at my insurance stuff and my, and my nest egg calculation and some of the things that we'll talk about in this episode, 
it's just a lot of moving pieces and it's a and 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 it's changed a lot over the years um so that's that's the first thing and i think the other thing is like you know this thing things change and i think having you know checking up on this is is really really important so when we look at like the when we look at the balance sheet again if you haven't looked at your balance sheet in a long time i think it's really important it's not necessarily something that we feel in our day to day yeah but if you if, you know, if you, if you put your head down and you're working and you're raising a family or doing whatever you're doing and, you know, two or three years later go by, you can actually see the the progress that, you know, has been made, right? So you can see, you know, how have your assets, you know, been built up? How have, how have your liabilities been paid down or not? You know, do you have a different set of, you know, versus if it's, was it student loans in the past and now it's a HELOC um, mm-hmm. or something like that? So I think it's really important to kind of recast the the vision recast the you know the organization of your financial plan and go from going from there from the vision perspective it's it's laughable when you think about you know like when i you know had these conversations with myself and my wife you know even three or four years ago and then what that looks like today like things like and 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 you don't sense that but like when you when you actually look back and you kind of memorialize hey in 20 19 pre pandemic, this is kind of our viewpoint. This is what we wanted to do. And then we look at that today. It's it's vastly different. Mm-hmm. So I think like, you know, one of the things that that I would, you know, challenge people that are mid career, you know, from a goal setting perspective is, are you doing the things that like, make you whole or that you're passionate about? You know, like I was joking around with my team over the weekend that I kind of felt like an Uber driver because I was driving to soccer practice and swim practice <laughs> and soccer practice again and swim practice again, which is great. Like, I love that. I love, you know, you know, um, you know, seeing my kids, you know, mm-hmm. do well in their sports and their activities. But, you know, another conversation that I had with my wife over the weekend was like, are like, are we are we good? Are we on like the, the, the track that we want to be on and kind of yeah. checking in with that. And sometimes that's a check in with yourself. Sometimes that's a check in with a spouse. Sometimes it's a check in with like a close mm-hmm. advisor, like a financial planner. Um, and I think it's really important to do that because again, you can put your head down and, you know, live, you know, be living your life, but then, you know, you're, you're doing that vicariously through your kids or, or, or whatever, mm-hmm. and not actually take the time, to do the things that you're passionate about. And sometimes, you know, again, you, 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 your, your, your own goals and ambitions are kind of take a, a backseat to your kids, which is a, it's a natural thing. But at the end of the day, like there typically is enough to go around. Like we can carve out time. We can carve out resources to do the things that you want to do, whatever that is. Um, so I think it's really important, you know, as you are mid career, and I think this is where, you know, people like, you know, they talk about like a midlife crisis because they kind of <laughs> get caught in the the rat race and they're like, this is not really the life that I want to yeah. live. Um, so, you know, I think it's that, you know, that self, you know, being, being critical and actually like slowing down and saying, is this what I want to do? Mm-hmm. Um, and then using the, the resources, you know, the time that you have, the dollars that you have to kind of write that ship and, um, because again, we're here a very finite amount of time mm-hmm. and it goes by quick and it sounds very cliche, but it's, it's true. Um, and I think you can, I always talk about this, like, you know, that whole, that sense of being on autopilot. Mm-hmm. I've worked at jobs where, you know, like my commute to the office in the morning was, was, it was darkness. I would, you know, I would drive there 30 minutes. And I wouldn't remember that drive. And then yep. the commute back was in darkness. I would get in my car and 30 minutes would go by and I'm home and I don't remember any of that. And that's, mm-hmm. I think that's like an analogy for life is that if you're not actually slowing down and thinking about, is this what I want to do? That's important. So that's just my life plan and hat. You know, are we, are we putting the first things first? Are we doing, you know, the things that we want to do and, and making sure that we're, we, we have a plan and we're being intentional for that. Tim, I love the example you gave of, you know, how for you and Shay and your family, right? Short period of time, the goals can look very different and why it's so important to be looking at these regularly and talking about them together to have a third party, you know, kind of help, whether that be a planner or someone else. I I was even thinking as you shared that, you know, for Jess and I, when you did the planning with the two of us, how helpful it was when we would get together to flash up the goals to say, Hey, a year, a year ago, you guys said, this is important. Like, is it still important? If so, like, what, what are we doing? What are we doing to kind of move this forward? And, and ultimately like, where are the funds, right? If it requires funds to do that. And sure. I think that's so important. You know, you and I had a very similar season of life where 
you know, to the point you gave of the weekend and being the Uber driver, like the, the days and the months are flying by to really have that mechanism to stop, pause, slow down and remind ourselves of like, are we running the path? Are we running the race that we want to be running? And we're not going to get it right all the time, right? Balance yeah. in every season of life, but to have some built-in mechanism to not just set those goals, but also to re refresh and to look at those periodically. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Number two on our list is savings. And we're going to talk in a, about a few different areas here. We'll talk briefly about the emergency fund and an opportunity to, to recheck where we're at with that. We'll briefly talk about retirement. Again, we've talked about all of these at length. We'll, we'll reference other episodes and then we'll touch on some kids college stuff as well. Tim, let, let's start with the emergency fund and a recheck. I just talked on episode 357 last week about five questions that we need to be asking ourselves related to the emergency fund. So make sure to go back and check out that episode. But I, I think this is one of those areas, Tim, where we set the emergency fund maybe early on in our career. And then we don't think about, wow, a lot has changed. And we really got to relook at is the amount that we have there sufficient? And how does this fit in with the rest of the plan? Yeah, it's it's one of those things where, yeah, it's kind of a forgotten, forgotten thing. And, you know, I, you know, what we really want to do is check in and make sure that, you know, what, what's in there is appropriate and, you know, are there things that we can do to, you know, to, to, to improve it. So, you know, for, for a emergency fund, what we're looking for is three to six months of non-discretionary monthly expenses. So these are expenses that are going to go out the door regardless of if we work or not. So think things like, you know, a mortgage and insurance premiums and utilities and a food bill. So, Unfortunately, Tim, to get to that number, we have to actually look at spending data and mm -hmm. understand like what that looks like. And then, you know, we kind of look at, you know, what is what is discretionary? What are things that are non-discretionary? And we add up all the non-discretionary. If we have, you know, two incomes, we multiply that by three. If we have one income, we multiply that by six for six months. And then and then that's our number for a lot of our clients. You know, it, it typically can be, I think, in a in a I would say anywhere between 15 and $50,000 yeah. is what is what is what the number is. Um, so I think like, you know, and, and this is something that Shay and I looked at recently. And, and I think for us, because of three kids and, you know, daycare and all that kind of stuff, it's, it's crept up. And I've kind of tried to, you know, the interest that I, that I accumulate in my high yield or yeah. my, or the, I, I do a, I do a combination of a, a high yield savings account and then like a, a, a laddered CD that mm -hmm. I do every quarter, like a, a year CD for every quarter. So I have a Q1, Q2, Q3, Q4 that I just renew. And I kind of let those ride. And I, I'm actually adding more money, both to the high yield and the and the CDs as we go here. But I the only reason I knew to do that was to actually look at the spending. And it's kind of crept up, you know, just because of family of, you know, yeah. probably the last time I did it, we were a family of three. Now we're a family mm -hmm. of five. Um, so I think that's important to do. And, and again, like there so many people that I talk to that they're like, okay, this brokerage account, this, this taxable investment account, that is my emergency fund. That is not an emergency fund. It's, it's, you know, if you're investing in it and you can see volatility, that's not what we're trying to do. So I think having, you know, the right amount and then the location is going to be really important and, and to get the right amounts, typically looking at the budget where you're at today. And, and again, like yeah. I don't look at the kids swim or, or, or soccer or other activities as a, discretionary uh, as a that's a, that's a discretionary thing so if mm -hmm. times got tough we would you know try to try to cut that so i think even you know examining what is you know what should be in there and what shouldn't um is important but you know to me it's it's a little bit of nails on chalkboard right tim's because i don't want to keep cash i want to get that into the market and get yeah. and get working so i need enough to get us through a tough spot but then also know that um you know for me i want to get money into the market and a lot of people typically, you know, later, you know, in, in mid career and beyond, they'll, they'll start because they have an asset like the house, they'll even use something like a HELOC as like an even deeper reserve. Yep. So to have access to a HELOC or something like that is going to be important that, that, that I've seen people use as a, a mechanism to, you know, to safely and, and, and I wouldn't say cheaply because of where rates are, but somewhat cheaply access cash if need it. And not necessarily tie up a ton of money in, in a in a check-in error or a high yield savings account, I should say. Yeah, I like the hack that you mentioned, Tim. Jess and I do the same thing where you know any any earnings on a high yield savings, we just kind of dump back in the emergency. Let it ride. Yeah, let yeah. it ride, right? And the idea being that's gonna help kind of keep pace at some level with with inflation, maybe maybe not fully. But to your point, it doesn't cover those big jumps, right? So like now we're a family of five instead of a family of three, or right. 
you know, we bought an investment property and we've got to be thinking about that, or we moved homes and, you know, mortgage payments went up. And so th those kind of big moves where all of a sudden, you know, that emergency fund might go from that 15 to that 30, 35, are we looking at that periodically? Well, and for you, Tim, it's probably like your food bill, right? Ooh, um, pre preteens, like, like that's gonna, and that's, that's like, no, that's no, no joke. joke, you know, like when you, even Olivia, Olivia is going to be 10 this year and she's a swimmer. I mean, she eats, I feel like as much as I do. Um, and you know, when you, when you think about that, that's, that's going to move yeah. down quite a bit. So, you know, it's, it definitely adds up. And I, and at the end of the day, the emergency fund is there for that rainy day when, when, when you need it and, and just making sure that's properly funded, it's going to be yeah. important to kind of give you that peace of mind. The second part of savings, Tim, I want to touch on as we work through these six different moves for mid-career pharmacists is, you know, I think this is a natural time where, where we ask ourselves, am I on track with retirement? Right. And, and this is a season where when we talk with pharmacists mid-career, you know, the visual I have is you're getting hit in every direction, right? You maybe got ki kids, expenses, kids, college has grown. We'll talk about that in a little bit. You've got this pressure facing you on retirement. We might be caring for elderly parents. You know, perhaps there's debt still hanging around while working through student loans or other things. There's, there's all these different pressures and headwinds. And, and naturally that retirement piece may, maybe wasn't a top priority for a while. And all of a sudden we get to this point where previously we couldn't visualize retirement. Now we can't start to, and it's like, ugh, am I on track? And I know we covered this in episode 272. How much is enough? We'll link to that in the show notes so people could dig deeper, but just at a high level, you know, some, some tips or some thoughts for folks that are asking this question of, Hey, am I on track? How, how much is enough when it comes to retirement? Yeah, I, this is such this is such a hard one because like I'll ask like prospective clients like, hey, do you feel like you're on track to meet like your goal for retirement? And if you're talking to someone in their 30s, 40s, 50s, I would say even in your 50s, it can be somewhat nebulous. Anytime it's like a decade more out. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and typically the the answer that I get is like, you know, it's I have really have no idea, which is I think problematic, especially if we're trying to like you know build out a plan. So that's some, obviously something that we can fix. But also it's it's kind of that default of like, well, like the 401k, you know, company or the 401k that I have, they have a, a calculator that says I'm on track. And I'm like, I just don't know how they calculate that. And I, I almost <laughs> feel like all the compliance things that tend that we have to I go know. through. So it's almost like irresponsible yeah. to to and I, again, they're looking at it very much from a but people don't necessarily know that. You know, it's it's very much of a vacuum. Um I I think that like the, the, the problem with like, a, am I on track for a retirement is that there's so many variables that go into it. There's so much time that goes into it. Yeah. You know, and I always talk about this, like when we, when I first started, you know, working as a financial planner, I remember working with my previous firm and it's like, you know, we would do financial plans by hand and we would do a time value money calculation. And we would say, Hey, Tim, Hey client, you know, you're, you're, your, what you need for retirement is $3.1 million. And it would be like this exact number. Um, and then we would kind of go on to like the next thing. I'll make sure you're doing this. Or <laughs> and it's like, it just never connected. It was like this, mm -hmm. it was almost like this, this associated moving. Cause you actually look at like what the client had, which might be three or 400,000. And you're like, I need to like 10 X this in 20 years or 15 years. It, and there's so many people that come back to me that when they start and then they're like four or five years, they're like, like, damn, Tim, like I actually, like my assets have actually grown. Like I, grown, I almost yeah. didn't, didn't believe you. And mm -hmm. it's still hard to even to see that, you know, the progress to get to that, that mm -hmm. millionaire level. But I think it's really important. And so like, I took that as a, as a financial planner, I would look at the, the clients, like their eyes would kind of like gloss over. Cause they're like, that doesn't mean anything to me. And I kind of, we, we built out this nest egg calculator that basically goes through and I did it recently for, for Shay and I, you know, what's your current age, what's your tar target, you know, so how many more years do you have left in the workforce? How, how long do you expect to live? Which is, again, that's one of the hardest, you know, that's one of the risks in a retirement is like longevity risks. Like, are you going to live really long or, or, or not? So again, that's a little bit of a crap shoot. So we kind of make, make some assumptions there. Social security kind of has an idea of when they think yeah. that you're going to pass away, what your current retirement savings is with so kind of think of that as your present value and your time value money. And then what you, your current calculate, you know, your current income is, and then what that kind of projects into what you need for retirement. Mm -hmm. So we make some assumptions on how is your current assets, um, actually invested. 
So for a lot of people that I see, at least it's in my opinion, too conservative, especially mid, you know, if you follow the, the rules of thumb of, Hey, if you're, you know, if you're 40 years old, you take 110 minus 40, your equity, uh, equity amount should be 70%. And then the other 30 should be in bonds. I think that is wrong. Um, but then we do some, you know, asset assumptions when you're actually in retirement. So it might be more conservative and that kind of gets down to the total need. And then you have to factor in things like social security. So I pulled my social security. I think we'll talk about that in a second. And then like, what does that mean in terms of what do I need to actually save today? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's the idea here is to take this big number, whether it's 3.1, 3.6, 2 million, 4 million, and actually break it down to a number that yes. I can digest. So like, if you say, if I'm, if I'm the client and I say, Hey, you know, if, if I'm talking to a client, I'm like, Hey, you're putting in 10% for you to actually get on track to retire by 65 to live the 95, whatever that is, you need to go from 10% to 15%. Like I can track to that. Yeah. And I also, you know, so that actually is a tangible thing. That's a, that's a digestible thing that I can do versus just saying, we need 3.1, mm -hmm. 3.1 million. And we kind of just are like, it's a hope and a prayer, right? So it, it's not, it's not a perfect system. Um, because like when I look at my own nested calculation, you know, I'm maxing out my 401k and it's assumed that I'm going to be doing that for the next 29 years. If I retire at 70, which that's a, I don't know. I mean, I don't know if that's going to be the case. I'm hoping that's the case, but, um, so there, there's, there's, there's some assumptions that we have to make to make, to make it kind of come to life. And I think the next level of this, Tim, is kind of going through some simulation. So if I were to, yeah. you know, if I were to, you know, take part of my portfolio and purchase X, or if I were to, you know, go and go down to part-time or, you know, do something else, you can actually run scenarios. If I, if I buy my, mountain house 10 years earlier, there's some Monte Carlo analysis that I'll actually affect, you know, show you how it affects your success rate with your, with your retirement. And I think that's kind of the next level of stuff. But for a lot of people, it's where am I at? What are the things that I'm, uh, that I'm doing today? How can I tweak those things to yes. get a better outcome? And, and that could be contribution rate. That could be my allocation. Um, that could be a variety of things. So I think that's important to kind of break down and really see, you know, cause the, the more, the longer that we wait to kind of affect change here, especially if it's negative, the steeper that gets, mm -hmm. right? So when you're when you're early in your career, you know, a, a tweak here or there can really have monumental changes. The closer you get to that retirement, just the the steeper that climb is, and the harder it is to kind of meet goals. And that's where you have to start. Then potentially taking a haircut on lifestyle and retirement, or you know, the amount of time that you have to work, et cetera. Yeah, and Tim, what I love about the nest egg exercise is, you know, going through it for Jess and I, again, just a reminder with all these things we're talking about, it's not a one and done, right? So if you, if you do a nest egg when you're, you know, 45, there's assumptions we're building into all of these types of calculations, both in terms of the mathematical assumptions, but also what you want. And, you know, you mentioned the different scenarios and that can change. That probably will change over time. So revisiting yeah. this periodically is so important, but it really moves. I often hear people talk about retirement as like a hope wish or dream, meaning like, I hope I can retire by 58 or 67 or whatever, or, you know, I would love if I could potentially work part-time at some point in the future. And it's like, Hey, yes, those assumptions can change. Many of them will change over time, but we can put a number to these. And to your point, let's get it down to what do we need to be doing on a monthly basis? Because these numbers do seem scary and, and you can see kind of the peace of mind that comes when you walk through these calculations with people, when you start with those big numbers, three, four, five million, and then you get down to that monthly, even if we don't love the monthly number, when we factor in employer matches, other things, savings we already have, we'll talk about social security here in a moment. It's like, oh, okay. Like we can work with that because we can put our arms around it and start to figure out, can we build that into the rest of the plan on a monthly basis? So, so important, especially for those mid-career listening. If you've done this before, you know, revisit this, uh, you know, we'd love to have an opportunity to work with you on the financial planning side. If you haven't done it before or need to revisit this as well, but something we definitely need to be updating and looking at periodically. Let's move Tim to number three, which is really looking at our social security benefits and the projected benefits, which I think fits so well into the, how much is enough calculation. And, you know, this is an opportunity to, to really look at our, uh, resources at ssa.gov to look at our statement, our projected benefits. I think a lot of people probably aren't necessarily familiar with these tools that are out there. And to begin to figure out and build some assumptions of, 
hey, if I have social security benefits, what might those be? And then certainly we can, you know, project down if people are worried about the future of the benefit. I'm sure you'll talk about that as well. But thoughts here on on kind of revisiting or looking at the social security piece. Yeah. So if you go to SSA.gov, like if you haven't done this, I would encourage you, especially if you're, you know, make career, just to kind of see what your social security statement looks like. Um, so to me, that's really important to kind of get a sense of. And again, like I think a lot of people when they when they think about social security, it's kind of an eye roll of like, uh, that won't be there when I'm, when I'm ready to retire, or, um, it's going to be greatly diminished. Um, you know, I, I would, what I believe is that, you know, social security is one of those things where, um, so many people rely on it to actually survive in, you know, it's kind of a, a hand, you know, unfortunately we're kind of like a hand to mouth in terms of like a lot of people don't do a great job of saving themselves, mm -hmm. especially, you know, no offense to baby boomers where there was pensions and things like that. Pensions and, and social security could go a long way in terms of retirement that that day is done, you know? So when we moved away from pensions and more to a 401k, the onus has really shifted from the employer to the employee to make sure that we're doing what we need to do. And, and again, social security is still there. But there's lots of, you know, press about, you know, will it be viable and, you know, will it go bankrupt? Um, I, I, my, my sense is that, you know, it will be there, Tim, when we retire at, at 70, but it's, it's kind of one of those things where um, it's, it's unknown what that benefit would be. And, and again, maybe when we retire, you know, it's not 70, it's 75 or something mm -hmm. like that because of a variety of reasons. But the, I think the big thing here is to pull your statement and then when I look at mine, it, it actually shows me, you know, what my personalized monthly retirement benefits would be if I started from age 62. So right now my, my benefits $2,076, or if I wait until age 17 and actually get the, you know, credits, mm -hmm. um, 3,777. The big thing with social security that, um, doesn't get enough play is the, it's inflation protected. So when we had that big jump in inflation the year before last, yep. you know, everyone's payment went up, I think 8.9% or whatever it was year over year. That's huge. Cause if you're thinking about, you know, building a retirement, um, paycheck, most of the things that you have, most of the income streams are not inflation protected. So every mm -hmm. time, you know, we go through bouts of inflation, your, you know, you know, the, the check, that, the checks that you have running in coming in are not going to account for the fact that, you know, your, your grocery bill went from a hundred bucks per month to 140 just because yep. of where that's at. So social security, you know, plays a part in that. So I think the big thing here is to kind of check, you know, when you pull your statement, you can actually see your work year and what your earnings tax for social security were from, you know, so I'm looking back from like 1991 to present day. So I think to make sure that that's accurate, that's, that's going to be a big thing. And again, like, I think the sooner that you can kind of look at this and, and kind of get a sense of where you're at and then and then look at the, you know, look at the 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 retirement calculator that's there. You know, if you if you retire early versus if, you, if you're full retirement age, you know, for us, it's going to be 67 um, or if you delay it out to age 70, which to me, I think a lot of people should really look at doing. And if you have a plan, you know, the, before yeah. the, the kind of the knee jerk was like, get the money when you can get it. But that's a that's a mistake. And a lot of people are understanding now that it is a mistake. So doing a, a proper analysis, again, it, it's kind of a, a microcosm of your, of your financial plan is, you know, inventory. So get organized in mm -hmm. terms of what does the statement look like? What are the goals in retirement? And then how to properly deploy this, this inflation protected income stream, I think it's going to be a big part. Now for pharmacists, you know, you're, it, it might be 25%, 20% of your retirement paycheck. Whereas, you know, the typical American it's, it's, it's north of 50%. Um, so, but I think making sure that we're positioning ourselves from, a, you know, to, to ensure that the income is correct. And then the, the, basically the way that we um, collect the benefit is going to be in line with your overall retirement picture and financial plan. Yeah. And I think once we have that number, and again, we can adjust up or, or down, as you mentioned before, as we're, we're running assumptions, but we can then build that into the nest egg calculation as well and, and see how that impacts where we're at on a, on a need for a monthly savings. Number four, Tim, on our list of six mid-career pharmacist moves to be considering would be the estate plan. We've talked about the estate plan in detail on the, up, on the podcast episode 310, dusting off the estate plan. We'll link to that in the show notes, but this is timely. You and I were just talking about this last week. Uh, 
you know, with your, your new baby in the house, right? There's an opportunity to update documents. Uh, we haven't yet done our, our, our updates with, with our youngest who's soon to be five. So we, we, we've got to make sure his name is present, although he's covered in language, but his actual right. name isn't present in the documents. Um, so I, I think again, talk to us through why there's an opportunity mid career to, to really be updating these documents or perhaps for some, even, even establishing these for the first time. Yeah, it's probably, you know, I can say this being a, a ginger, but it's probably the redheaded stepchild of like the financial plan. Um, mm. it's, 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 it's ignored. Um, and unless you're military, a lot of the clients that are coming through the door really don't have an estate plan in place. And, and one of the things that we implemented to kind of really combat this and, and, and really supercharge our ability to support clients is, you know, we have a, a an estate plan and solution now that we, when we work with clients, if you don't have a a will, a live and will trust if that's needed, we can actually yeah. get those documents in place for whatever state that you live in country, which I think is awesome. So, you know, it's, it's one thing to kind of, you know, say, Hey, Tim, this is what you need. It's another thing to actually like walk side by side with you and get the documents in yeah. place to make sure you're covered. So I look at this really from a, from, from two, pers- you know, two, well, I would say it's one big perspective, it's just change. Right. So like, you know, if you think about, you know, maybe when you were, you know, early career to where you're at now, for some people, like, could be different relationships. Like there's mm-hmm. horror stories about people that are leaving money to like an ex. <laughs> um, so I think it's really important to kind of do a beneficiary check to make sure mm. that the money is going to the right people. You know, Shay is going to be my primary beneficiary for like a lot of the things that I have. But then right now it's like Liam, my, 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 or Olivia, my daughter and Liam, my son, who are the contingent beneficiary. So if something were to happen to both us, like they would go to the kids. So like Zoe, our, our newest, our newest baby has to kind of be in on that. Or it could be to like a trust, you know, yeah. a, a trust that is for the benefit of the kids, which is probably the better way to go with minor children. So to me, it, it's it's more of again looking at the 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 relationships, um, whether they're you know out with the old in with the new, um, or you know brand new with, in terms of kids, to make sure that the documents that you had in place clearly reflect your wishes today. It could even be things about you know bequesting or yeah, hey, I want to leave you know, money to my alma mater or to my cousin, Fred, or things like that, that that still really reflects the things mm-hmm. that you want to do. Um, but also, you know, to, to ensure that from a protection perspective, you know, if you have dependents, they're, they're, they're taken care of in a sense that, you know, if, if you were gone or you couldn't speak for yourself, the documents that are, that are in place, you know, to do, do that justice. So for a lot of people mid-career, it is adjusting what they have, or it could be, it's just that, that thing that's been neglected that you're like, yeah. I'm going to get to it. I'm going to get to it. I'm going to get to it. And you have it. Um, you know, I'll, when, when I'm talking, when I'm talking to prospective clients and I, and I bring up the fact that we, we can do this, that like perks them up. Cause they know it's important. They know it's like, uh, I got to find an attorney or yeah. I got to find mm-hmm. some sort of solution. We got that covered. And to me that alone, I think, especially if you're, you're, if you're a family or if you, you know, I typically say that the estate plan is really important really for anybody, particularly, but particularly for people that have a spouse, a house or mouths to feed, right? So if you have those things and you don't have documents in place, I think that that's a, probably the biggest thing that we need to look at. You know, it's important to get, you know, a, a plan for debt. It's important to get your, your nest egg and a plan for your assets and, and retirement planning. But this is really going to be important mm-hmm. to shore up and make sure you're good to go in, in the event that something were to happen to you. And again, it's one of those things like, oh, that won't happen to me. It will happen to somebody yeah. else. And then eventually you're going to be that. Mm-hmm that's someone else. So, um, not to be morbid, but you know, I think it's important to, to cross those T's and dot the I's with regard to the estate plan. Yeah. I mean, the reality is just like, we'll talk about in the final item number six on the insurance side, like it's not fun to think about, right? So it's, it's easy, been there myself. It's easy to kind of drag your feet and, uh, let, let this be the call to action to either update, take a fresh look at those or get those documents created. Number five on our list of six mid career pharmacist moves to make Tim, it's probably one that a lot of people maybe aren't thinking about. Again, not necessarily the most comfortable thing to be doing would be some of the financial conversations with aging parents. You know, I think it's common that we see mid-career pharmacists that are entering into a new stage of caring for elderly parents. Sometimes that, you know, could be a, a time investment uh, that they need to factor in. That could be a financial investment. Uh, and for some, you know, that might be, hey, this is an expense that we need to be thinking about caring for our elderly parents. Or others, it might be, Hey, do, do they have the documents, the right documents in place that we just talked about? And do we have an awareness, understanding and transparency into that information, which admittedly is a very hard and awkward conversation to have, no matter which way we're looking at it. So 
thoughts here on some of the financial conversations with, with aging parents? Yeah. So I think this can be both from an estate planning perspective, but also like a retirement perspective. So it's, it's very common for, you know, our clients, you know, maybe who are, you know, first generation immigrant that, you know, they basically say, Tim, I am the retirement plan for my, my parents. Right. Right. So, so I think like building that into their, into the, our client's plan is going to be really important because that's, that's part of uh, their culture. That's part of the, the, the goal that that's, I think that's, that's important. I think beyond that, you know, is more of the estate plan and stuff. So I look at this as we have to, we have to secure our own estate plan. So our client's estate plan, but then what are the, what are some of the things that can negatively affect, you know, and I'm talking negatively in terms of like financial um, mm -hmm. and maybe some of the legal and logistics, it could be the, your parent, like elderly parents that don't necessarily have a sound estate plan. So whether that's, you know, we, we've talked about this. Um, what's the book, Mo Mom and Dad, We Need to Talk um, yep. about mm -hmm. some of those some of those conversations or some of those um, instances where because of a lack of estate planning and, and fores foresight, it's negatively affecting um, the child's plan or finances or time because they're they're suing for conservatorship or, mm -hmm. you know, there there's just things that you you don't expect. So this is a tricky thing because again, like I grew up in a household where you know, we didn't really talk about money that much, so it's kind of a, a touchy subject. Um, so how do you how do you go about having those conversations and and have you know have access to the detail that you need, but not but being respectful and not necessarily prying where you know that where your your parents maybe feel uncomfortable. But they're adult conversations that need to be had because if you wait too long. Then again, you're you're putting yourself in a position where you either can't care or provide, you know, yeah. the 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 support that you need to a parent, and it can ultimately, you know, negatively affect your own plan in terms of your, you know, financial resources, but also time. Mm -hmm. um, so, I think this is one of these things where, again, whether this is a a family conversation around the holidays, or it's a, a an email or a letter, or it's hey, this is a shared document. Um, even to give me passwords and, you know, I'm not going to access it until the time is needed to be able to do the things. But, you know, if something were to happen to your parents today, like, do you know how to log into their, their different accounts? You know, what, what is the, what's the plan? And that can be a very uncomfortable conversation for some people. And for some people, it's not, it's like, it's yep. just, this is what it is. So I think just to have that conversation, um, and to understand where to go, what are the proper documents, what are the accounts? I think if you can do that before, you know, there's capacity issues or, or whatever, I think it's going to be really important. So that's, that's the big thing here. Yeah. And that's one of the things I appreciate so much, Tim, about Cameron Huddleston's book. You mentioned mom and dad, we need to talk is it does provide a nice kind of third party. And she's got some great suggestions in that book of, of specific questions to ask, how to ask them, how to ignite the conversations. And you know, I think having that third party resource, even if you're referencing that of, Hey, I read this book and, you know, it got me thinking that we should have a conversation and, you know, likely it's not going to be everything addressed in one conversation, but it opens up the door. Sure. It's going to be uncomfortable, but for, as you mentioned, for some people, maybe not depending on how they grew up around money, but so important that we understand, you know, what, what is the potential financial impact? As you mentioned earlier, for some, if that means caring financially for their parents. Um, and even if that's not the case. There's just a lot to consider in the estate planning process that we want to make sure uh, that we're honoring the wishes and aware of what, what's going on as well. So number six, our final item on the six moves to consider for financial moves for mid-career pharmacists, Tim, is an insurance checkup. Again, not the most uh, exciting part of the plan to be thinking about. Here I'm thinking about term life insurance, long-term disability, perhaps beginning to think about long-term care insurance as well. I know we've talked about term life, long-term disability even long-term care extensively on the show before, is this an opportunity to reevaluate those policies? You know, I'm, I'm thinking of this situation just as one where let's say somebody in their early thirties bought a 20 year term. Now they're at the end of their late forties and they're looking at that saying, Hey, the term's coming up here in the next, you know, five, six years. So talk to us about how we might look at the insurance part of the plan here as a mid-career pharmacist. Yeah. I, I think like in the absence of like a, like an actual insurance, calculation, you know, a lot of people will use a, a rule of thumb for term insurance of like 10, 10 to 15 times income, which again, that could have changed over 
the years if you know if you ha you have a 20 year policy and you bought it in the early 20s or 30s and now you're you know 40s 50s like what does that look like you know going yeah. forward so i think like i think you know and i think the other thing too is are there other wrinkles in your financial plan um i.e hey if, if i were to pass away you know, one of the questions I would ask myself is like, do I want to be able to send, like, do I want to, do I want Shay to have to worry about the mortgage or mm -hmm. paying for the kid's education? Right. So maybe that's something that like I, I built into my, my plan going forward. And I didn't have that, you know, 10 years ago. Um, but now I do. So like the other thing too, is like, you know, again, mid career, if you're, if, if you, you know, maybe bought a house and moved out of the house and now rented it, like what, what happens from an insurance perspective? Like, do you want, that property to be paid off. So I think like, I think, yeah, there's, there's this renewal period potentially of like, what do you need? And, and again, maybe it's not, you know, maybe, maybe you buy a 10 year term policy to kind of bridge it. Maybe you don't need another 20 year, maybe you do, but I think there's also mm -hmm. things that you can um, in a proper calculation say, okay, this is important to me. This is not important to me. And then reflect that in, in insurance. So obviously I think the the life insurance is going to be really important. For some people, it's even getting it in place, which you right. know, you know, people just like the estate plan will drag their feet on that. Long-term disability, again, that's one of the things I'm not really worried about short-term disability. I think without it, I would just plus up the emergency fund. But from a long-term mm -hmm. disability, you know, again, how has your income changed over the over the course of the you know the years? You know, if you're if you get it through a group policy, that's going to typically be a function of what you earn. But you know, if you have your own policy, should you supp should you supplement that policy because your earnings have have, have continued to climb? Um, you know, does that make sense? Long-term care, we typically, you know, the, the, our thought here is we want to, we want to support the client as much to age in place. So, so much of the science or so much of the studies show that the longer that you can be in your own surroundings and age in your mm -hmm. own home, whatever that looks like. So that typically means bringing in some help as you age, um, you know, that's going to be important. So what, what can we do to buy a long-term care policy to, to, to meet that minimum. And then again, different parts of the country, that's going to be a different, different amount per month. But we typically want to look at this, believe it or not, in our late forties, early fifties, because there's this sweet spot of, you know, if you're too early, it doesn't make sense. If you're too late, it doesn't make sense in terms of the, yeah. the availability of the, of the policies. So what does that look like? So uh, typically late forties, early fifties is when we want to have that conversation. Um, and again, a lot of people, they kind of just like social security, they kind of blow this off. Like, this is not for me, but, you know, I think more and more of, of, you know, the, the industry is trying to support clients as best they can to, you know, age in their home residence and, and, mm -hmm. you know, and, and do it versus going into a facility or something like that. So long-term care is going to be really important. And then the last one I would mention, Tim is property and casualty. Um, mm. so doing an assessment here, um, Holista plan, which is our tax tool, uh, has this deliverable that we're testing out now that looks at homeowners, auto and, and an umbrella policy. And, and, oh, nice. and what it does is try to find gaps in, in coverage. And if you think about homeowners, if you haven't dusted that off in, in a while, like what your home was, you know, if you bought a home at 35 and now you're 40 over the last five years, your home has appreciated a lot. So are you underinsured in that regard? Um, you know, do you have enough assets or is there, is there a risk there that you should have an overarching umbrella insurance to cover risk if something were to happen or if you were to yeah. be sued? So these are kind of, again, next level um, things to kind of consider and just doing a checkup from an insurance perspective. Do you have the proper life, long-term disability, is long-term care something on the horizon? And then from a property and county perspective, are we, are there risks there that we don't know about that we should have kind of you know, a circling back to make sure that the coverages that we are, that are currently in place, um, are, are, you know, suitable for what you're currently at in terms of, uh, of, of risk. Yeah. And that's a good call out on the property casualty, just with the appreciation, you know, is a good, good reminder for me, as you mentioned, I was thinking about, we had a, a fire of a house in our neighborhood. It's probably been sitting now for over a year and a half. No, no movement on the home. And all I can think of is it's probably some type of insurance issue going on, trying to work through the process, but you know, that that's exactly the question that came to mind, right? Of, Hey, you know, what, what is the replacement coverage that you have? Um, what's the, the timeline of that replacement and given the appreciation and the cost to rebuild a fresh look at those policies, you know, is, is certainly warranted. Yeah. I mean, I just, I just got a picture here from Shay fire, fire in the next neighborhood fire started in the garage with a lithium battery battery charger catching on fire. 
So this is like no as way. we're as we're recording here. This is the the picture and and from Shay. So like this stuff is important. Again, if we haven't dusted that off in a while, you're you're leaving yeah. yourself open, um, you know, to to risk that we don't. And, mm. and I think it's somewhat of an easy fix to to to, to mitigate that. Well, I hope all is good there. Um, thanks again for great, great stuff, Tim, as we look through these six mid-career pharmacist moves. For more information and details on each of these, as a reminder, go to yourfinancialpharmacist.com forward slash mid-career. Again, mid-career is one word. And for those that are looking to work with uh, one of our certified financial planners at YFP on your individual financial plan, which would certainly touch these six areas as well as many more, Make sure to head on over to yfpplanning.com. Again, that's yfpplanning.com. You can book a discovery call. We'd love to have the opportunity to talk with you to see whether or not our services are the right fit. Tim, thanks so much. And uh, we'll, we'll catch up again here in the future. Thanks, Tim. As we conclude this week's podcast, an important reminder that the content on this show is provided to you for informational purposes only and is not intended to provide and should not be relied on for investment or any other advice. Information in the podcast and corresponding material should not be construed as a solicitation or offer to buy or sell any investment or related financial products. We urge listeners to consult with a financial advisor with respect to any investment. Furthermore, the information contained in our archived newsletters, blog posts, and podcasts is not updated and may not be accurate at the time you listen to it on the podcast. Opinions and analyses expressed herein are solely those of your financial pharmacist unless otherwise noted and constitute judgments as of the dates published. Such information may contain forward-looking statements, which are not intended to be guarantees of future events. Actual results could differ materially from those anticipated in the forward-looking statements. For more information, please visit yourfinancialpharmacist.com forward slash disclaimer. Thank you again for your support of the Your Financial Pharmacist podcast. Have a great rest of your week.